Mr. McCoy here with part nine of writing the flume. As you recall, Francie asked her father, can a person own a tree? He frowned, of course. We own the trees in front of our house and the ones on the front lawn of the hotel. Francie tried again. That's not what I mean. Could a person own one of the sequoias? Her father looked at her and then at her mother as if asking for an explanation. Her mother lifted her shoulders slightly and shook her head. The lumber company owns most of the sequoias, he said. He folded his napkin and placed it by his plate. Why do you ask? Francie swallowed. Did Carrie own a sequoia tree? Her father's face fell into the cold, blank expression it wore whenever Carrie's name was mentioned. I don't know what you mean, Francis. Of course, Carrie never owned a sequoia. How could she? His voice shook with sudden anger. What a ridiculous notion. He pushed his chair back from the table and stood up. Wait, please. Francie turned to her mother. Old Robert gave Carrie one of the sequoias. Today, Charlie and I found it on our walk. It's huge, the biggest tree in the world. Her parents were staring at her open mouth. Francie looked from one to the other knowing she was talking too fast. She wasn't making sense, but she couldn't stop. It's Carrie's tree. Old Robert left it to her in his will. I know it's hers. Carrie said so. It's in her diary. The last words fell into profound silence. Francie watched her mother's hands begin to tremble. Her diary? Her mother whispered. You found Carrie's diary? Francie nodded. It was, it was in her room. She found she couldn't quite give away Carrie's careful hiding place. Francie's father grabbed at the tabletop as if himself to keep himself from falling. Abruptly, he sat back down in his chair. He opened his mouth, but then shut it again. Without saying a word, Francie got up from the table. She walked into the kitchen, got the diary from the shoulder bag, and came back into the dining room. Her steps seemed as loud as gunshots in the quiet room. Here it is. She placed the little book in the middle of the table. The dark blue leather looked almost black against the white cloth. Her parents stared at it. Then her mother turned her head away. I don't want to read it, she whispered. She was trembling and she clenched her hands into fists in her lap. I can't bear it. Her father cleared his throat. His face was white, but his hand was steady when he picked up the book. We, we looked for it after she... He stopped and cleared his throat again. <clears throat> but we couldn't find it. He looked at Francie. Have you read it? Francie looked at him, and for an instant she thought she saw such pain in his eyes that she wanted to cry out. But then it was gone. She wondered if she'd imagined it. I've read part of it. Parts of it, she said. It's like... But her father interrupted, and his voice was sharp. What about the tree? Francie jumped, startled by his anger. It's the last entry. Her voice faded away, remembering the mention of the White Mountain walking tour. He shouldn't have to read that. Here, she reached over and took the book from her father's hands. When she opened it, her mother stood up, pushing her chair back so fast it screeched across the wood floor. I can't listen, she said. She held her napkin to her face and almost ran from the room. In a moment, Francie heard her feet on the stairs. Then, in a trembling voice she knew would still sound much like her sister's, she read Carrie's last entry. August 13, 1888. I saw old Robert again today. He took me up over the mountain and showed me my tree. My tree. It is enormous, bigger than any other sequoia in the entire valley. Maybe it's the biggest tree in the entire world, and so old. Think of the history it has witnessed. I can't fathom it. It is so, so beautiful. A prince among trees. No, a king, an emperor. And I am the steward. No, I am the knight, sworn to protect my emperor or die in the attempt. Can old Robert really give me a tree? He says he can. He showed me the will and it looks very official. He says I must not tell anyone about this great gift. But how can I keep silent? I am bursting with the joy and the responsibility. She looked up. Her father sat with his head in his hands. His elbows rested on the table. She wondered if he was crying. 
Father? She reached out, but as she touched his arm, he jerked it back away from her. And what was your question? His eyes were red, but quite dry. Could, could Carrie own that tree? He shook his head. Old Robert was a little crazy when it came to the mountains. He smiled, but to Francie it looked more like a grimace. He used to walk around town shouting about how the lumber company was ruining the mountains. Once he even called down the wrath of God on Thomas Connor. He rubbed his hand across his eyes. I'm sure he thought he was doing something noble in giving Carrie a tree. And from her words, his voice broke then. His breath came in a half sob, quickly cut off. With a jerk, he stood up and paced over to the sideboard. With shaking hands, he began arranging the salt and pepper shakers, the china cups, and little knickknacks in a line. He picked one up, a delicate china shepherd girl in a light blue dress, and looked fixedly at it rather than at Francie. He continued, Your sister was a faithful child, as her words show, and old Robert might have truly believed that he was giving her one of the sequoias, but the lumber company owns all that land. Carefully, he placed the china girl in line with the others. Lewis Granger graciously let the poor old man live there, but I'm quite sure his cabin was on Lumber Company land. Then, still without looking at Francie, he walked out of the room. In a moment, Francie heard the front door open and then close again, and she knew he was going back over to the hotel. She sat in the quiet with Carrie's diary in her lap. I shouldn't have told them, she whispered. They're still too sad. Do you agree with Francie that she shouldn't have told her parents about the diary and about the tree? Share with your fellow listener. She blinked away her tears. Her father wouldn't come back until late. He might even work all night. Nothing more would be said about Carrie or about the tree. And especially nothing would be said about the diary. Ever. She picked up the book and held it to her cheek. This was all that was left of her sister. She opened the book at random and read another entry. November 30, 1887. It is snowing and the last of the loggers left a few days ago. There will be no more tourists until spring. Charlie begged his mother to let him stay the winter with us, but the answer was no, as it was every year. So he has to go back to St. Joseph and go to school. Poor Charlie. I would much rather do the lessons Mama makes for us after the hotel closes for the winter than have to leave the mountains and go to school. Winter is one of my favorite times in the mountains. Everything is so quiet, as if I am the only person awake in the entire world. After a snowstorm, I am like Eve walking alone through God's creation. Mine are the first footprints ever to mark the new fallen snow. The next sentence was heavily crossed out. Francie stared at it until her eyes burned, but the words were lost forever. And then Carrie had written the last sentence in an even more scrawled hand than usual. Papa has finally given me permission to go out. I will take Francie with me. I will be Adam, and she can be Eve. We will discover the world together. Her name, written in Carrie's diary. Francie smoothed it with her finger as if by touching her name, she could somehow touch her sister. She thought she might even be able to remember that day, the snowflakes flying thick, landing on her lashes, the warmth of Carrie's mittened hand holding hers, keeping her from falling as they stomped through the snow, making footprints. Francie blinked. Her lashes were wet, and it took a moment to realize that they were wet from tears and not snow. She shut the book with a snap. She was just now beginning to discover Carrie's world, and she had to do it alone. She began clearing the table, breaking the silence with the clink of dishes, the clatter of silver as she tossed knives, forks, and spoons into the empty vegetable bowl. She pumped water in the big kettle and thumped it down onto the stove. She tossed a few more pieces of coal from the coal bucket into the stove and let the iron lid clank down. At least, when her mother crept downstairs in the middle of the night, she'd find the dishes already washed, dried, and put away. After she went up to her room, she opened the secret hiding place in the wardrobe and placed the diary inside. I need you, Carrie, she whispered. 
smoothing the soft leather cover. She lowered the false bottom and closed the wardrobe doors. I don't think I can do this by myself, and there's nobody here to help me. It wasn't until she was in bed and drifting towards sleep that her father's words came back to her. I'm quite sure his cabin was on Lumber Company land. He hadn't said Robert's cabin was on Lumber Company land. Somehow, the way he'd added, I'm quite sure, suddenly sounded to Francie almost as if he wasn't really sure at all. But before she could examine that thought more carefully, she was asleep. So do you suppose Robert's cabin was on company land or not? Share what you think with your fellow listener. 3,251. 3,252, Francie said and put her finger on the tiny circle of wood in the exact center of the old stump. 3,252, she said it again, out loud, even though there was nobody else in the basin to hear her. Only the squirrel who kept scurrying up the trunk to check on her and then scrambling down whenever she made a face at it. Did trees feel? Could they think? Did this one have any idea what was happening when Bill Weaver or whoever was the faller made the first chop with, with his axe into its bark? She looked to the north and with her eyes she followed the path that wound through the basin, the same path that yesterday had led her to Carrie's tree. How old was that one? Would they cut it down too with as little care as they had for this one? She knew they would if they found out about it. She closed her eyes and with a little prayer that Charlie would keep this secret, he was good at keeping secrets. Hadn't Carrie said so in her diary? The cotton shoulder bag was lying beside her in a puddle of soft gray fabric that outlined the shape of the diary inside it. She had been going to keep it in the hiding place, never take it out again, but somehow she couldn't. Not yet, she whispered. She slid it out of the bag and then searched around until she found the pencil she decided at the last moment to bring. She opened the book to Carrie's last entry and then turned one page. June 16, 1894. Her hand was shaking. She put the pencil down and wiggled her fingers. Then she began again. Dear Carrie, today I finished counting the rings on the old sequoia stump first one they cut in Connor's Basin. It was 3,252 years old. I shall write Mr. Cord a letter telling him. I haven't seen any of his articles because Father takes the newspaper to work with him. I think he does it on purpose, so I can't read them. He's letting me count the rings on the stump, but he won't let me say anything against the logging. She stopped, read the words she'd just written, and then smoothed the page with the side of her hand. If she were alive, Carrie would be furious to find her sister writing in her diary. But now, Francie bent her head and finished her first entry. Someday, I will climb Connor's Peak, like you, Carrie. She lifted her head again, an idea bubbling inside her. Suddenly, she couldn't write fast enough. In fact, I will go all to the pla- I will go to all the places you went. I'll write about what I see. It won't be what you saw because of the logging, but I'll try to imagine it the way you saw it. That's all for now. Love, Francie. P.S. Postscript. Please don't be mad at me for writing in your diary. Francie closed the book, feeling a little silly. It wasn't as if Carrie could actually read what when Francie wrote, uh, could know what she was thinking. She sighed. I wish she could read it and answer and tell me what to do. The squirrel had been sitting on the top rung of the ladder, watching her. At the sound of her voice, he dropped his acorn and disappeared over the side of the stump. She leaned over the edge to watch him scamper down. Why don't you tell me what to do? She called after him. She sat with her legs hanging over the edge of the stump and looked at the diary. She wanted to climb to the top of Connor's Peak to read Carrie's words, but according to the diary, it was an all-day climb. Or Carrie hadn't minded missing supper, but Francie didn't dare risk it. This would have to do. She opened the book again. June 16, 1887. 
Francie stared at the date. Carrie had written it exactly seven years earlier on this very day when she decided to fill up Carrie's empty pages. The thought came with a shiver of goosebumps up her arms. She read on. I saw old Robert today, just a glimpse of his battered hat and torn coat through the trees as I was walking down Connor's Peak. That means he survived another winter. I'm glad someday I will find out where he goes. He told me once that he hibernates. He couldn't have been serious, but with old Robert you never know. He's a strange creature indeed, almost like a bear at times. Francie closed the diary, keeping her finger between the pages to mark the place. It was a little like reading a novel. If she kept on, would she find the truth about the tree and old Robert? What do you think? Share with your fellow listener. Moments more are in store. Keep listening. June 21st, 1887. Today I visited old Robert at his cabin. It was truly an honor. He saw me in the basin and invited me to tea. His voice was cracked and gravelly as if he hadn't used it much, but he has such a nice smile. I said yes, and then without a word, he turned and marched off. I followed him up Connors Creek. His cabin is about an hour's walk from the basin near the place where the creek forks. It's a beautiful place surrounded with wildflowers. Dogwood grows all around and monkey flower and a stunning bunch of flocks in one place where the sun shines most of the day. You wouldn't expect to find that one in the woods, not enough light except in that one place. Old Robert boiled the water in an old kettle over a tiny iron stove and served the tea in two delicate china cups. Why do you suppose he has china cups in a rugged mountain cabin? When I asked him, he acted as if I had not spoken at all but he did ask me to visit again. I think I will. He has two books on a corner shelf in his cabin, the Bible and Shakespeare's sonnets. He can recite both from memory. It was quite amazing, this old bear of a man quoting Shakespeare's love poetry. We will find out more about what Carrie has written in her diary as writing the flu continues.